Well, the, uh, the summit is over, and you know the amazing thing is that Gorbachev didn't defect. <laughs> I think, I really think he wants to, but maybe he's a little nervous about living in a country where Dan Quayle's a heartbeat away. <laughs> the, uh, the other thing they didn't do, well, they didn't do a lot of things, but the main thing they didn't do was settle this question of German reunification, which is really a tricky question. They're gonna have a meeting later in Europe, and all the Europeans are gonna get together and decide it. Well, they understand France offered to surrender if it would help any. Um, you know, this, the, the one thing he said, though, that really struck me was he said this, the Cold War is over, and let's not quibble about who won. <laughs> oh, easy for him to say. It's hard not to gloat. You know, who would ever think that the fatal flaw in communism would turn out to be that there's no money in it? You know, especially considering what communism is and everything, a political philosophy that states to each according to his needs, from each according to his ability. And I know that sounds very attractive in a coffee house over 10 cups of espresso, especially if you need everything and have no abilities. Which, pretty what much sums up the state of the communist world right now. And when you look at what they have, they have a collapsing infrastructure, they have a disintegrating industrial base, they have massive underemployment, people leaving in droves. All they need is crack and it'd be as bad as the Bronx. <laughs> they have a unit of currency, their ruble is not even considered to be money in the rest of the world. You know, if you think it's hard to get rid of Canadian quarters, <laughs> you should have a pocket full of kopecks. <laughs> And I know the Bolsheviks had a great idea in 1917, and this was their idea that if they took the financial incentive out of exploiting the masses, no one would do it. Little did they know that people exploit each other just for the fun of it. <laughs> so the only difference under communism is that your boss man is just as broke as you are. <laughs> so you end up working for someone who's in a bad mood all the time. <laughs> but we shouldn't laugh, and most of you didn't, I appreciate that. <laughs> but, because... If, if money is gonna be the ultimate arbiter of the success of a political philosophy, then we're in trouble too, because we might as well start kowtowing to our bosses over tea and doing calisthenics in unison at the factory every morning. The way I see it, the main difference between communism and capitalism at the moment is that we can borrow money from the Japanese. <laughs> now, I know the Japanese don't play fair. Now, I know this because I heard a congressman say so, and I know he was giving me the straight stuff because he was running for president at the time. <laughs> and the reason they don't play fair is that they won't let us sell them anything. And that's why you hear all this talk about leveling the playing field and opening their markets. Now, of course, we all know that the average Tokyoite can't wait to trade in his Honda if he could only somehow get his hands on a Chevette. <laughs> but <laughs> even if he did, that's not gonna solve our trade balance problems. You see, the problem is not that they won't buy our stuff. The problem is we won't buy our stuff. <laughs> no. So, we never sold the Japanese anything. They're never gonna buy our stuff. They never did. I don't think they like us that much. And when you think about it, they have a point. <laughs> I mean, I can understand they might hold a grudge. But if we would just start making... <laughs> If we would just start making things well enough for us to buy, I think we'd very soon be out of these troubles. For example, if Ford and General Motors could crack the American market, <laughs> these problems would disappear in no time. And that is why the opening of Eastern Europe is such an exciting thing for our economy. Because we already make things well enough to sell to them. <laughs> you know, no, I'm not kidding. They have cars they make in East Germany that they can't trade at the border for a pair of Nikes. <laughs> you know, I think that the Polish market might be just the thing to get American Motors back on its feet. <laughs> They're ready. I mean, that's all they want to do is buy our stuff. It's like Kennedy said, there's no prouder boast for free people anywhere than ich bin ein shopper. <laughs> But on the other hand, that's why this Latin American debt is going to be such a drag in the future, because we also make things well enough to sell to them, provided we loan them the money to do it. <laughs> Which we can't do, because they owe us so much they can't pay the interest. Now, I have a solution to this, but it's too complex to go into right now, and I'm saving it for the upcoming group of seven. It involves ten pesos and a chain letter. But I don't want to go into the whole thing right now. Because... 
When you think about it, it's like Gorbachev said, the economy is the least of our worries. You know, last month we had an Earth Day where everyone was out planting trees to save the planet. Of course, they're going to cut them all down again at Christmas. So I don't know if we really make any progress. <laughs> <laughs> you know, with all of our global problems, it all is rooted in one thing, and that is the insufferable vanity of the human species. You know, 21 years ago, we went to the moon. JFK wanted to make Khrushchev look bad. Or maybe he wanted to impress one of his secretaries. We'll never know what the real reason was. But that was like a high point of the Cold War. But even at that, as soon as Neil Armstrong stepped out in a sea of tranquility, what were his first words? One small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Like the rest of the ecosystem didn't even exist. You don't know thank you to the plants that made the oxygen that fired the rockets. No mention of the Cretaceous mollusks who laid down the continents one stinking shell at a time. <laughs> Without a government contract, I might add. <laughs> you know, if I were another link in the food chain, I'd have taken that as a deliberate snub. <laughs> you think the least you could have do is throw a bone to the invertebrates who backed us up and we're a bunch of nobodies? <laughs> I'm not going to castigate Neil Armstrong for mouthing banalities in his moment of triumph. Although I don't even think he wrote it himself. It sounds more like Neil Diamond. <laughs> is this, that the two great plagues of mankind on this planet are what they've always been, vanity and ignorance. And of these two, ignorance is probably the worst. You know, one out of 10 of your fellow citizens in America today, in 1990, is functionally illiterate. And you can say, so what? You know, they're not gonna vote because they don't want to risk jury duty. <laughs> but those people are a danger to this planet. Millions of them are going to give directions at gas stations. <laughs> you know, and then, that's going to waste millions of gallons of gasoline into our air. <laughs> Untold thousands more every year will defrost refrigerators with sharp objects. <laughs> Why? Because it can't read SI and releasing chlorofluorocarbons into our atmosphere to further degrade our ozone layer. You know, when you think about it, maybe the best thing we can do is plant trees because they provide us two most crucial elements to our survival, oxygen and books. Thank you very much.